So um, my name is Salona Bonvald, and I am the uh, executive director of IEEE SA Open. And, um, and I wanted to talk today about diversity and inclusion, um, specifically about how to open up open source more. Um, <clears throat> we've been addressing this a lot in um, IEEE SA Open. And so this is kind of be kind of from this, but also kind of from my own life experiences since I've been involved with open source for like 20 years now. So, um, and I wanted to start it off by talking about some of the problems I see in open source software today. You know, one, the communities aren't very diverse. The quality varies a lot. There's a lot of security issues and abandonware and burnout and volunteers and toxic communities and these ingrained biases. And then you have corporate dominance and all these sustainability issues. And I think one of the ways out of that is going to be diversity. Um, and what happens with diversity is you get a lot of things like this value of expertise and experience. So you have this collective um, agency and collective accuracy that you can then start to use and exploit. And then you can also, you get all these other perspectives, which helps a lot with innovation and creativity. Um, of course, once again, you get more eyes and bugs become smaller, but they become even better with that if you do actually have that diversity of thought in regards to what are all the ways that it could be hacked? Where are all of the other weak points? Where do those things kind of occur? And then also you get much better communication with diversity because it kind of forces you into it. And we'll talk about that in a little bit when we talk about inclusion. Um, you also get increased productivity and um, improved performance. So there's a lot of documentation on this and you can ask me about it afterwards. Um, the Harvard Business Review has been talking about this stuff for, you know, 14 years now in regards to all of the amazing things that you get in regards to diversity. There's been a lot of studies that sit there and show the more diverse teams you have, you know, the better off your um, projects are. So it's, I think at this point, it's not so much about diversity, but inclusivity. Um, because if you have diversity, but you're not inclusive, it's not going to be sustainable and you're going to lose all of that diversity. So you can go out there, you can recruit, you can do all of that. But if you're not ready for those people for when they come in, you're going to break it. And it's kind of funny. I found this great definition of inclusion, believe it on the, or not, but on, on the HUD website, hud.gov. And they talk a lot about it being a state of being valued, respected, and supported, about supporting the needs of the individual and making sure that everyone is there to achieve their full potentials, to um, reflect on the organization's culture and practices and relationships to actually support the um, diversity that is there and creating something that works with everyone um, based off of all of those capabilities. So, that's kind of what I want to talk about. And so it's like with the types of diversity, um, we have like some known ones that we're all used to now, right? Um, a lot of identity politics right now is part of diversity. You know, what is your, you know, sexual orientation, you know, gender, race, things of that nature. Um, but there's a lot more than that in regards to diversity too. You know, there's different regions, there's different cultures, there's all these different perspectives and experiences. Um, and you need to bring that into the question when you are talking about that. And that can also give you a lot of insight in regards to inclusion. Because a lot of times inclusion, um, it's not as easy as you think. Um, what does it take to be a good al ally to people, um, to be inclusive in regards to that? Well, a lot of times you need to ask them. <laughs> and I think a lot of times people forget that they want to sit there and project their own cultures and values and things upon that and sit there and think that that's what's appropriate. Um, but in the end, you need to work with them to help decide that. So um, I know that like these days, there's a lot of stuff that's very cringe, um, where we don't realize we didn't have the correct perspectives back in the day, for example. Um, you know, I like to think about 80s movies. I've been watching um, 80s movies with my uh, teenagers and um, ouch, <laughs> you know, we thought that we were doing all these fun, good things. And then we go back later and we realize through a new focus that actually this wasn't very good. There were these problems, you know, this wasn't appropriate. That wasn't appropriate. This is how this was impacting, at, you know, impacting other people. And we always have to bring that thought process into all the different things that we're doing and how we're looking at it moving forward. Um, so um, it, I'm, I'm sorry, Jim, I know you just talked about meritocracy. 
<laughs> but I think the thing that people forget is that meritocracy itself was actually a joke. Um, it was a book that was written to make fun of it. And um, it, it's one of those things that it was like, uh, I think it's interesting. It's like great in concept, but horrible at implementation. Um, there's a lot of uh, political systems that I think we believe fall underneath that. Um, and so we need to be very careful about, you know, going towards this um, direction of meritocracy. So at IEEE, we decided to go after roles first. Um, and the reason that we did that is because we were looking at more um, functional versus demographic diversity. And instead of going after the normal identity politics portions, we were instead like going, oh, one of our major goals, and this is an important part about doing inclusion and diversity is figuring out what your goals and your mission are. And for that was sustainability and um, production readiness and being ready for other nonprofits and doing things of that nature. And so that meant that we needed to expand the roles that were there. Um, the, you know, open source is really good at writing open source software for developers writing for other developers. We do great with Kubernetes, we do great with Apache, we do great with Linux, you know, all of those things do really well. What we normally fail on is things that involve the users and the user design and things of that nature. And one of those major reasons we fail is lack of diversity and, and lack of um, inclusive processes and procedures. And so we were like, oh, how are we actually going to go in there and do that? And so we decided on roles for another one that's really interesting, which kind of, once again, butts against the head of, of meritocracy, is that one big problem that you have is they're like, oh, there are no titles, there are no roles, there are no da-da-da. It's like, that works when everyone's the same, but it doesn't when everyone is diverse. Um, you do have to acknowledge and accept expertise. You do have to have the different roles um, and the different understandings in regards to that. I mean, that's like one of the basis of peer review is that you do have to have the peer review aspect to sit there and say, oh, these people are qualified to say whether or not something is good or bad or how that works and things of that nature. And so you really do have to look at allowing things like expertise and titles to um, play a role. Um, and then one other thing that you have to strike a balance in regards to all that is knowing your audience and your stakeholders. And so if you are going to expand out of open source and just writing developers for developers, but you do want to write for a nonprofit or government, or you want to make something production ready for lots of people to, of diverse backgrounds to use, then you need to like reevaluate your stakeholders and you need to figure out what that is so that you can actually start to figure out how to target that. And I think a lot of times developers, because they're so used to being developers and not a product manager or a designer or things of that nature, aren't typically used to how to go in and figure that out and find those questions. And so that's one of the things that we have to go in through and look. And so when you're going through and you're doing things in regards to inclusion, you really need to learn how to respect everyone's culture in regards to all of the diversity that you're bringing in. They have a lot of different needs and desires. And again, Harvard Business Review did a really good um, report about this. And there was also a paper published in sciencedirect.com about expecting individuals to fit in undermines the potential that you actually get from the diversity. So don't crush them into little bitty boxes to serve, you know, whatever it is that's happening in your group. Instead, you need to acknowledge who they are and their differences and bring them in. Because to be quite honest, the majority, they'll just leave. So expand your stakeholders. And also make sure that you've got really good mechanisms for feedback. The more diversity you can get in your feedback as well, the better off you'll be. Um, I found that a lot of open source um, groups almost depend entirely on mailing lists. Okay, <laughs> but that's not a lot of very diverse feedback. I get it. It feels very, um, uh, it has a big sense of meritocracy in regards to it. Everybody can sit down and write their stuff out and do all that kind of things. Um, but you're not actually going a lot of times to where your users are. You know, I find that like when I was working at PayPal, all the recent college grads, they're all in chat they don't want email, you know, you're not going to get that. And then also a lot of the users, you know, they don't want to go through and do email. They want to be on social media. They want to have all of these other different avenues of feedback. And if it, in open source, you don't have multiple avenues of feedback, then you're never really going to know 
um, what you need to be doing to maintain your diversity and create better projects. So that kind of leads me into the next topic, which is gatekeeping. Um, you have to be really aware as to when you're accidentally gatekeeping. And I think we do this a lot. We have to look at our processes. You know, are our processes public? Because there's so much that's tribal knowledge, right? That ends up being an issue. Um, are they um, pu published somewhere? Is there documentation supporting them? You know, where does all of that go? Our tools. Um, requiring designers to use GitHub is not always the best set of tools that, for them to use. There needs to be better tools to come in and support them. Um, and then also governance. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more, but governance ends up being a huge gatekeeper. If, you, you, if there are no ways of anyone to be able to have a, their point of view being truly expressed um, in regards to what's happening for the project, then they're not gonna use your project and they're gonna leave. And then also um, recruiting. If you only you know, recruit in the same goldfish pond, if you're only on GitHub and that's all you do and you expect to get diversity, that's not gonna happen. You're gonna have to get out on social media. You're gonna have to go and follow some different people. You're gonna have to get out there and do a bunch of other work to actually recruit to create the diversity that you need. And then of course your events. You know, If your events are only in person and they're only in one area and they're only in one time zone, you're, you're gatekeeping and you probably don't actually even realize that, that you're doing it. Um, especially a lot of times you don't even realize that you're gatekeeping on those events by um, who can actually afford to attend one. Um, the virtual events have been great because I feel like it's opened up to a lot of different people, especially um, people with disabilities and such, where they can attend and not have to worry about, you know, all the logistics to getting there and things of that nature. Um, so just be aware of when you're accidentally gatekeeping. And another, really big thing you have to think on is, you know, what is participation going to look like for your group? So if you want diversity and you're bringing in a bunch of different people, you know, what does it look like for them? Do you have something ready for them? Do you have anything along those lines so that they can come in and feel included um, at the beginning? And if you don't have things for doing that, then, you know, you're probably not gonna keep your diversity. They'll show up, they'll look around, they'll go, this probably isn't for me here. I'm gonna keep, keep moving. Um, one of the things that I find for a lot of this is, you know, earlier I talked about the tools and you, and you really wanna look at your tools and its processes. Um, one of the things that I find that happens a lot is what I call convenient data. Um, some other people like that call it lazy data. Um, but for example, on GitHub, you know, there's a lot of measurements that are happening, right? Where people are like, oh, we're gonna go measure you know, these normal identity dynamics like gender and sexual orientation and, and race. Um, but of course, some of us purposely hide our gender on uh, GitHub for reasons. Um, some of us don't want to be, you know, singled out or identified um, by our race. Um, some of, you know, there's all of these different problems with that. And the tool, to be quite honest, doesn't handle it correctly. Right? It doesn't obscure it. It doesn't make it private. It doesn't do any of these other different things. It's just there and it's convenient. And I feel like that's one reason why the meritocracy of open source is so broken is because it is very developer centric. It's about pull requests and commits and things of that nature, which any product you know, owner will tell you are poor metrics. Um, they're not going to actually tell you what's happening with those tools and those designs. And so be very careful about that. Um, and when it comes down to all this, and I talk about all this gatekeeping, and I talk about all these different things, um, does it feel like open source is really open if, if you're not striving towards these things in regards to inclusion and diversity? Um, I would say that certainly doesn't feel fair. As a person who was a coder for many, many years, and then when I transitioned over to open source, I suddenly started doing things that were beyond coding because I was the director and all this other different stuff. And suddenly my status dropped dramatically. And it was kind of horrifying because I had an identity crisis of I'm not a coder now, and now no one cares about what I do. Um, and so, you know, be careful in regards to that, in regards to fairness um, and, you know, to be truly open. I would also, again, challenge on this for the governance portions. There's a lot of groups out there, and I think Jim talked about this a little bit too, right before me, 
um, on the OSI licenses, but you know, visual isn't open. Just because you can visually sit there and see it and you can do all those different things. It's like, well, okay, you can fork it. Eh. We all know that that's not an extremely realistic thing and it's very difficult and it's extreme and it's very painful. I know I've been there. Um, but instead, openness needs to be more about participation. And how do you actually go through and incorporate the participation into the processes of your open source project so that it isn't gatekeep, so you don't have gatekeepers? You know, for example, on decision making, you know, how do you earn a vote? What is that? You know, are you going to go through and do things like, oh, I'm sorry, your pull request was just a, some typos, while these pull requests were way more important than yours, so you don't get to vote, but you do? Uh, that's like, it gets really negative. Um, and in fact, at some point, you should probably go read about black voting rights and suppression timeline because there's just like so many different things. You don't want to do taxes. You don't want to do literacy tests. You don't want to charge. You don't want to do any of these different things. How do you actually earn a vote? And that has to be something that the community creates and agrees on. And um, you'll not, you won't get good decisions on that if you don't have the diversity part in there first because then you will get people who create isolationists, um, governance, you know, things like the benevolent dictator for life. You know, those aren't very inclusive um, models. Um, also in doing open source, I think one thing that we fail at a lot is design. And, and that especially follows through in regards to accessibility. And on that, it really is about the diversity aspects again. If you don't recruit designers and you don't recruit all of these other different people who are telling you, you know, what is happening and what is going wrong and you don't have those good feedback mechanisms, you're not going to be able to, you know, make it to that next maturity level. Um, you know, designers, they study all of this. Designers understand diversity on a level that, you know, developers typically don't. And that's because, well, it's one of the things that they study in college is how do you be as inclusive as you can in regards to your design? Um, anything that locks other people out is a problem, you know? And, and I think sometimes with developers, we get a little bit too pragmatic in our solutions where it's like, oh, someone's hard of hearing. Well, I guess I better shout. While a designer would go, do you know what would be great is if you added captions <laughs> or if you put some text in here or if you did something along those lines. Um, and so I think, you know, it's really important that you include the diversity that is the designers in regards to your projects. Um, I think one of the biggest gotchas to realize, though, in regards to all this is I'm telling you a bunch of different things and you're going, oh, my gosh, this is just so many things and so much stuff. And it's, yeah, um, a lot of this reflects production readiness, you know, that a lot of corporations do you know, to make sure that their products roll out and can, you know, hit the most amount of customers and get the widest market and do all of that. Um, but, you know, you have to prioritize and you have to figure it out and you have to sit there and see who comes and who doesn't and, you know, engage with them. Um, one of the things I love are unconferences and they have the law of two feet, which is whoever is there are the right people and you bring them in and make sure that you're inclusive to everyone who does show up. And I think that's one of the problems sometimes that we have in open source is um, it's not about who shows up, but who sticks around and, you know, trudges through the sludge with us. Um, and that's, that's going to cause problems. Um, you have to change your mindset in regards to that. And you need to instead think about how friendly you can make that first impression be so that you don't lose any of those contacts. Um, and then just remember with all of it, as you increase your diversity, you know, change becomes your constant we're going to make mistakes. I'm sure I probably made some in this talk. Um, I, we don't know what's going to become cringe later. Um, but you have to sit there and remember that things will be moving around and, you know, changing underneath you. So um, just to give some examples about all of this and like some cultural examples, you know, one, be very careful of assuming. And so there's some basic things that you could go in and create. You know, one is vocabulary create some glossaries, make sure that you've actually gone through and defined all the different things that you're talking about and why you're talking about them, you know, have an FAQ. Um, with your tools, make sure that they're accessible and collaborative, you know, break down any barriers that you have in regards to that. 
Are you having problems with, you know, using certain tools with certain um, countries? Look at a different tool. Are you having problems with time zones? Look at something asynchronous. Are you having language issues? Look for something that'll help with translating. There's a lot of different stuff out there that you can go in and do to reduce some of those barriers. And also, like I said, feedback, feedback, feedback. Um, you know, retrospectives are awesome, issue boards are great, or service desks, surveys, interviews, even workshops, and of course, always, you know, try to pay attention to your social media. Um, I know that most open source projects don't realize that they should have something on social media and should be following it, but you really do, even if, even if it's just a really simple little Twitter handle, um, something along those lines that makes it a little bit easier to reach you, I think is always going to, to be helpful especially if you're responsive to it, you know, and be careful of accidental gatekeeping. I think the major, the biggest ones I see is lack of documentation. If you don't have documentation, you're accidentally gatekeeping to new people. A lot of times people don't know what to go look on. Like they don't know how to get started on GitLab or GitHub at all. They don't know what any of this is in regards to helping engage with you. They don't understand how to, um, you know, even sometimes file a service desk complaint. And so that's why they'll go to Twitter instead. So be careful of your accidental gatekeeping. Um, and there's, you know, there's all these examples of the, where I watch people accidentally do gatekeeping too. In fact, I would sit there and say, <clears throat> underfunded open source projects are accidental gatekeeping because not all of us can afford to work on open source projects without getting some kind of compensation. Um, or at least not extensively, and it leads to things that aren't sustainable, unpaid internships. I mean, what um, you're basically biasing that towards wealthier individuals who can afford to not be paid. So, you know, be really careful. And, and there's also like other different things, like just having meetings in certain time zones can be a real problem. <clears throat> or requiring that people publicly speak. Maybe English isn't their first language. And so they have a problem with doing it. You know, just be very aware. Um, because the benefits that you'll get out of this is huge. Um, newbies are so valuable. Um, first of all, they lessen your tribal knowledge because they'll come in and say, yo, where is the such and such? I don't understand how to get started. Where's the, the you know, and they know. They've also probably been using <laughs> your project already. And so they have some good things in regards to quality and usability from a perspective that maybe you haven't seen yet. Um, and the other thing to do is to remember that most volunteers, they really want to know exactly what's going to be expected of them. So if they si sign up and they show up, they're going to be like, what exactly is it that you want me to do? Okay, I'm a designer. You know, no, I'm not just going to make your logo. You're going to have to talk to me about your project and what it is and da, 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 da. And then I can help you create a logo or, you know, we need to, to go through and do all of that. Um, and of course, newbies, they're also, you know, just talked about that documentation issue. Um, they're a lot of times good at helping you create and fix your documentation because they can come in and find it and fix it. Or if like the first person comes in and says, Hey, I'll walk you through all this. Can you take notes and like publish them? And even if they're not great notes, sometimes just putting something on that, you know, on that white space makes it easier for the next newbie to come and go, oh, 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 that's not actually right. That's this, you know, th those are easy changes to come in and do and to fix and to work with other people. And it makes your stuff way more inclusive because then everybody sees, oh, here's the documentation. Oh, I can fix the documentation. You know, this is all really easy. I can start to figure out how I can participate here more. Um, <clears throat> your tools need to reflect that. I am very biased and I think that when Ever necessary, you should try to use free and open source tools. Um, I know that sometimes that's impossible. You know, we're dealing with it at IEEE SA Open, and that there's not a great huge amount of stuff in regards to doing marketing and social media and things of that nature. And so we've been like working through a lot of different pieces and things of that nature. But you really should try to go open source um, because. That way you can help it evolve as well, just as you help yourself, your own project evolve. Um, also, if the tools aren't, you know, transparent and um, traceable and flexible and showing all the different work that's going on, then you're probably going to have some other additional problems. And then, of course, if they're not respecting privacy and legislation, then you're going to have even more 
Um, so you really need to make sure that your tools are going to reflect this insane, the same inclusiveness aspect that you would like to make available to everyone. Um, you know, and tools gatekeep themselves, right? Maybe a tool has a really large learning, learning curve. You know, oh, you want to do something to the website? Well, let's talk here about, you know, CI, CD, and pull requests, and writing your tests, and da 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 da. It's like mm, that's a little much. Um, I say that GitLab's metrics end up being a form of gatekeeping. It's not meant to be, but because of what it's measuring, it ends up doing that. Even sometimes using GitLab versus Google Docs, you know, ends up being a form of gatekeeping. A lot of people understand how to use Google Docs, but they don't understand how to collaborate well on GitLab and doing pull requests and things of that nature. Nature, it's, it's, it's confusing. But then of course, Google Docs versus firewalls in China, yet another form of gatekeeping. <laughs> you know, what's the person to do? <laughs> well, next cloud. Um, but, um, you know, which makes me come back around to the metrics portion um, with a lot of your different tools because they all have their ways of creating those metrics. And I would caution everyone to be careful about convenient data because then you really do get the scenario that is talked about in the rise of meritocracy where in the book, The Rise of Meritocracy, the reason it makes fun of it is because it basically sits there and states at the very beginning, we are not on equitable ground. Um, and since we do not start from equitable ground, um, the measurements that you create uh, exponentialize the problems from that. So, you know, be very careful in regards to it. And so when you're looking at your merits, you need to sit there and think about what the impacts of those metrics are going to be. Um, if there's rewards, what are those rewards? Um, you have to constantly evolve them because there will end up being um, problems in regards to that. So, you know, thinking a little bit more on participant rewards, um, you know, there's three real elements that you need to think about and they're, they're fluffy, but they're very real. And the first one is, is it healthy? Is it going to actually encourage the behaviors that you want? Um, because if there are unhealthy mechanisms like counting commits, for example, someone's just going to go write a bot to make a bunch of commits, right? Instead, you want to encourage something that's healthier for the community to do and do well. Um, you also want to make sure that it's accurate. And a lot of times, what does that actually mean? Um, I'm not talking precision. Um, instead, you know, working with the community and working with a diverse group to determine what is actually motivating what is motivating to users, what is motivating to volunteers, what is motivating in regards to those things. So, um, you know, I want to, I want to change sometimes I think people's perspective on accuracy in regards to that. And then also it needs to be kind. Um, too often I see awards that are very demotivating. Of course, I do subscribe to Daniel Pink's um, discussion about intrinsic motivation, but you know, you want them to be kind and generous. Um, and they need to fit the community and the community's wants and desires. Um, you know, at IEEE, one that does really work well is we have rewards. And so the students are very motivated to go and get an award um, at the same conference as a bunch of their heroes who are also getting awards. And those awards are also all chosen by their peers. You know, it's voted on by a different group of peers. And so that makes it very, very motivating. Um, you know, and then of course, like with publishing all the peer reviewed papers, those become something that has the community has created a validation system that feels very real to everyone. And so it does become a very good reward to um, everyone to go in and do and, it, and it's not necessarily a financial one, um, but it is a recognition. And it is one that the community desires. Um, <clears throat> I think the main thing to talk about on this is remember this is all an experiment. It's changing all the time. It's supposed to change. This means you need to prepare for it. <laughs> you know, know that. Understand that in regards to expectations. Um, always keep that scientifically open mind. You know, all these things are called theories for a reason, right? Because someone can come in and challenge it at any point in time and say, ah, this isn't working for me and this is why. And you can sit there and have those conversations. And if you do it with kindness, and with listening, um, hopefully you can find that ground as to effort versus um, desire 
for getting some of those different things done. Um, <clears throat> remember, some of this isn't easy, um, especially doing consensus mechanisms. Consensus mechanisms do take time and effort. Um, and there's a lot of different um, methodologies in regards to making that balanced. You know, at IEEE SA Open, the SA stands for standards. Um, and one of the things that I've learned <laughs> is that there are so many different ways to create a standard. And that has a lot to do with all of the different, the diversity in regards to consensus mechanisms. I think the key element of that is figuring out what your community feels comfortable with. You know, your community may not need Robert's Rules of Order. Your community may need something simpler. Your community, you know, might not need extreme forms of hierarchy or things of that nature, but you do have to figure out what that's going to be. And one thing that's kind of awesome that happens in regards to that is it does make it better in the long run. Um, it makes you, it makes your open source project into a better project um, where more people will use it. And if you have more people using it, then it's easier to recruit all of these other different things happen in regards to it. So, you know, set expectations, um, have very transparent discussions about governance and processes and process changes. It's probably one of the first things you actually have to document. Um, I know that that's not where we go a lot of times the first point. That's why so much open source evolved from benevolent dictator for life. Um, but it's not a sustainable model. And it's not one that allows for high levels of inclusion. Um, it does end up being limited because you end up being limited by a single person's perspective. And regardless of how open-minded that person is, um, they will still unintentionally limit the community and its engagement and its participation. So be careful about that. Um, another aspect is also do less so that the volunteers can do more um, and making sure that things are volunteer driven. I'm a huge fan of volunteer driven governance. Um, I know that there's a lot of stuff out there right now in regards to it, but I feel like, you know, governance and the technical steering committee or whatever you want to call the group that takes care of things really needs to be elected by peers. Um, and if it isn't, then you're going to have a lot of other problems. And so this is one reason why I think open source is crucial for the world right now. I'm having a lot of discussions and open source is expanding. Um, you know, I'm talking with governments. I'm talking with, you know, public policy people. I'm talking with, you know, the public sector. I'm talking with nonprofits. There's all of these other entities that are now really seeing the value of open source. One of the main things that I'm working on convincing them is that our governance can work well with their needs in regards to that, because currently a lot of those entities don't see open source that way. They see open source as insecure. They see open source as chaotic. They see open source as corporate dominated, especially in Europe. Um, they see a lot of these other things that are happening in regards to that. And they want to not have it be that way. They want to have it be more egalitarian. And so um, I believe that we're at a crucial point for open source where we can make a transition to being another maturity level in regards to it. Because, you know, we're babies. We are so new at all of this, you know, in regards to a lot of the other things, you know, constantly get reminded at IEEE, you know, they've been around for 130 years and like one of their published papers was Nikolai Tesla's. Um, you know, it's like, there's a lot that's there. And I think that if we can make this jump to the next maturity level in regards to inclusion, um, we can make these next jumps in regards to governance and um, all of those uh, necessary steps to dominating the world. <laughs> so I wanna end on the reminder that kindness is key and is a very key element to what we're doing. Um, you know, we all make mistakes. Uh, sometimes we slap the comedian, um, but <laughs> we need to remember um, to come back to that kindness and the forgiveness aspect and always have that in mind when dealing with our volunteers and the community at large so that we can create better systems. And I think I can do um, questions. Oh my, now I look at the chat. There's so many chat. <laughs> 
I love you guys. Yes, yes, definitely on the good ally, ally, ally thing. It's like you have to ask them. Um, yeah, the cringe, boss. Yes, uh, I know, especially the FL. Mm -hmm. um, it is true that the, the the tech community, the jargon is just such a problem. And so the more of that that you can do, I am so bad about jargon. I'm like, I will not, I, 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 I am horrible about it. Um, because sometimes, you know, there's a reason jargon exists, right? We as nerds want to be accurate, right? So we invent a new thing for the new thing that we feel like we've created. Well, when you do that, citation needed, I need to see something in that their dictionary or that glossary. So yes, please. Uh, totally, totally on the leadership skills. And that's one thing, remember, you know, as an open source developer, you don't have to be the benevolent dictator for life. You don't have to be the leader. Find other people who are good at doing that and who want to do that for you and work with them and bring them in in regards to that. Yeah, I'm a huge Octopus fan. Um, it's, it's, I'm just, there's octopuses up there too on the cat jungle gym. So yeah, that's totally, um, so awesome. Thank you, Rhonda, on the accidental gatekeeping. Yeah, it's just, it's just one of those things that I know we don't mean to do, you know, but we do it and it's so, it makes me so sad, especially since I know that I've done it more than once. You know, I don't know how many times I've gone, oh, it's easy. Just do da da da. And it's not easy. <laughs> so, you know, accidentally gatekeep right there. So, so thank you, Remy. I um, um I uh, I, uh, I do reread um how to make friends and influence en enemies every five to ten years. So yeah. that's probably my Hi, Silona, I would like, like to yes. Yeah, I would like to point out the, that that there is one question in the um, Q and A section. Um, would you like to take that as well? It's from okay, yeah. Dave okay. uh, McAllister. Awesome. awesome, it showed up this time. Okay, often projects only allow us to find to get up issues. Yeah, um, and not only that, but honestly, doing GitHub issues for security practices is also not ideal either. Um, I think that that is definitely not a best practice, Dave. <laughs> Um, I think you should have other different ones. I think you should have a specialized email. Um, so uh, one of the things we are working on at IEEE is um, there is a new study group that's talking about um, uh, best practices in open source project governance, which I highly um, recommend to check out. Let me actually, I'll type the URL into chat um, where we're actually talking about some of those things because it's it's a real um, it's a real problem. So it's uh, the o o o o s s p g for open source software project governance, um, and uh, yeah, and so it's just like um, you do have to have something that you need to have like a private email or things of that nature. Um, you know, not everybody can do the twenty four seven support that I have at IEEE. But um, you do have to have something along those lines, and it has to be discussed. I find that you know it seems to be trendy right now to do codes of conduct, um, but I haven't seen many things actually happen. Um, oh, thanks, Sebastian, on adding the you know click here, don't report in public. Very important to definitely do, um, <clears throat> and you know and it's always hard to do that balance between effort and um, things that need to be done. Uh, but you know, that's what that whole prioritization piece is about. And sometimes guys, gals, the code isn't always your priority. <laughs> I know that as a developer, you want it to be because <laughs> after all, we want to get this thing finished, but it's not always. The sweet point, um, between for enough inclusion, um, you know, you're going to have to decide that a lot of times. Um, we're going to talk about the best practices on that standards guide that I was talking about, but you know it varies a lot for size, right? Um, sometimes when you're three people coding, you're going to start off with benevolent dictator, okay? 
Um, but you know, make sure that you've got something written up where you sit there and say, we're doing this right now, but we want to transition when we reach X number of people, then we're going to. Um, or, you know, here's what we're trying to do in regards to inclusion. When we get to there, we can. Um, and I think a lot of times, if at the very beginning on your README, you put the fact that you're open to seeing all of these things, that alone is a big door to open for people, where people sit there and see that, oh, on your README, you've gone, oh, said, and said, hey, we're really looking to talk to some designers and gosh, we could really use some help on social media or I don't know exactly what I'm doing with these nonprofits, can you help me? Um, so there's a lot of stuff there. Um, I know with IEEE, we're looking at doing some global codeathons where we purposely um, look at the open source projects and um, partner them up with nonprofit entities and designers and things of that nature. So that even before the coding starts, we go through an entire you know, evaluation process and do th some things of that line. In fact, we're talking with, um, the Digital Impact Alliance and the um, Digital Public Goods, which does all the SDGs for the UN, the Strategic Development Goals for making the world a better place, you know, all those other different things um, to help with the goals and priority setting and hopefully eventually with funding. Um, because I think that's one of the things that happens with the effort portion is um, trying to figure out the sustainability portion. You know, when do you go from, you know, coding um, on something out of love and when do you need to be more sustainable in regards to it and how does that transition happen? Sorry, I wasn't meaning to be sarcastic on the readme. Um, for non-coding contributors, um, first of all, chat. Oh my God. So we use Mattermost because it's open source. Um, and uh, that's one of the reasons it's the very first thing that we included on our GitLab CE platform is um, that's where a ton, of, a ton of stuff happens in chat because that's where designers and nonprofits and you know all these other people come in and they, they don't have a problem with it. Wikis, a lot of times are really useful in regards to that. That's how I got like when I was at Hyperledger, um, once I, put everything on a Confluence Wiki and centralized and did all that. The Chinese groups just went, we have a, we had a Chinese working group and they just went nuts. They like translated everything and then translated all of their stuff back over. You know, just like, boom, like it was like this huge opening up for them where they didn't have to like get on Google Docs by, you know, sneaky getting on a VPN and da, 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 da. They were like, nope, we can all get in here. So a uh, Wiki, I think is really good. Um, communities, GitHub. Yeah, the GitHub part with the marketing people is just, I, I feel 100% your pain. And that's one reason we're having a big evaluation of the tools. And um, uh, I know there's been a big campaign internally from our members about um, looking, we're looking hard at Nextcloud and um, one of the open documentation pieces so that we could start to include that because they at least wanna have slides and spreadsheets um and trying to do that with Martin <laughs> is like you know um I, I don't even know so we are doing a lot of different um things in regards to that so uh I, I definitely feel your pain in regards to the marketing community um it ends up being very difficult because the, it's hard to share the tools you end up being basically going all the way back to that old word doc phenomenon of like sharing the word doc all over the place like how many versions of a word doc or a, of a slide deck or something along those lines you want to put into GitLab? Ugh, horrible so yes we are looking at its inkscape um for uh some of that and uh, we've been using mattermost instead of rocket chat you know one half dozen of the other it's fine uh and so and like i said we are looking at next cloud and um one of the document tools not sure which one we're going to go with yet um, they are doing POCs on all of that right now. Um, and then, of course, we also have a bunch of other uh, tools that we switched over to. In fact, with GitLab, especially the CE portions and the, um, the website piece for doing the um, GitLab pages um, to help on the documentation issue so people can kind of like work into WordPress um, and then be able to publish it because that seems to be a little bit easier than um, just straight uh, GitLab. Any other questions? Uh, I think that was all the questions and awesome. it was like perfectly on time. We are exactly at three hours, 15 minutes. 
Awesome. That was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. So Thanks. it was a yeah, it was a wonderful talk with a lot of deep insights. So thanks for for sharing it with us. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. The next talk will begin in another 15 minutes at uh, three hours, uh, 30 minutes, and that will be the last talk for the day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And everybody, find me on Twitter. <laughs>